My name is Erin Schmidt, and I'm going to discuss the ethics of mandated HPV vaccinations. The HPV vaccine has been in use since June of 2006, with a goal of protecting girls and boys from the human papillomavirus, which causes numerous cancers. Its acceptance into standard vaccine regimens has been limited. Why has this life-saving vaccine been, accept been less accepted than other life-saving vaccines? Should this vaccination be made mandatory? What are the ethical considerations in doing so? What are some oppositions and concerns that make individuals more cautious about this vaccine, but not others? HPV, re HPV refers to the human papillomavirus, the sexually transmitted infection plagues an estimated 14 million Americans yearly. Such infections can lead to cancers of the female reproductive organs, including the cervix, penile cancers in men, as well as cancers of the anus or mouth. Since the initiation of the HPV vaccine, HPV infections, cervical precancers, and genital warts have decreased by 86%. So the real goal of HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. By immunizing against a virus that 80% of the population will have in their lifetime. Immunization is typically initiated on adolescents between the age of 11 and 12 and involves a two-dose series. So should such a life-saving vaccine be mandatory? Why have at least five jurisdictions chosen to require HPV for school attendance, but not the rest? What are the sticking points? Concerns and oppositions to the HPV vaccine are numerous. Because HPV is sexually transmitted, it brings to the table the discussion of teenage sexuality. Parents often feel the topic of sexuality mustn't be discussed or addressed outside of parental parameters, and promotion and acceptance of the HPV vaccine will lend itself to teenage sexual promiscuity. Others hold concern for safety as the HPV HPV vaccine is rather new to the market with only a track record dating back to 2006. Some parents hold that the vaccine has not yet stood the test of time. Numerous ethical issues come to light in this example. Compulsory vaccination requires much deliberation. Vermeer and Dawson formulated seven principles for collection, collective vaccination programs. Let's look at each one individually. The first one is collective vaccination programs should target serious diseases that are a public health problem and each vaccine must be safe and effective. As previously discussed, the prevalence of HPV in the general public is high and up to 80% of Americans will have it in their lifetime. It's estimated to cause approximately 35,000 cases of cancer in men and women in the United States each year. With vaccination, as many as 32,000 of these cases are preventable. The HPV vaccine has been used since 2006 and administered in 120 million doses. Most side effects are minor, such as localized swelling or redness, nausea, headache, and fainting. The second is the burdens and inconvenience for participants should be as small as possible. Um, the HPV vaccine um, has minimal burdens and inconveniences overall. The third, the program's burden to proof benefit ratios should be favorable in comparison with alternative vaccination schemes or preventative options. Two vaccines are available. There's Cervarix and Gardasil, and the effectiveness is about 80%. Without vaccination, infection rates are still high, despite technological advances in screening, uh, such as the pap smear for screening women for cervical cancer. Number four, collective vaccination programs should involve a just distribution of benefits and burdens. Financially, the cost of HPV is higher than other vaccinations. The question of financial burden does arise. If HPV vaccines are given to those under the age of 18, the Federal Vaccine for Children's program covers these and covers these children that do not have adequate insurance coverage. 
Also, the question arises as to if HPV vaccines are mandated, is this just for females? What about the males? Shouldn't both genders carry an equal burden of disease prevention? Shouldn't the benefits be distributed between both males and females? Number five, participation should generally be voluntary unless compulsory vaccination is essential to prevent concrete and serious harm. This is debatable. The question arises if a vaccine is not mandated, will individuals seek vaccination for a cancer prevention measure? What is considered concrete and, ser and serious harm? The statistics about HPV infections are certainly concrete, but does everyone consider cancer, cancer serious harm? Number six, public trust in the vaccine program should be honored and protected. Numerous vaccinations are already required for school entry in the United States. Is there a limit to the number required? Should public health officials keep the required list to a minimum in order to instill the trust of the community? Is there a tipping point where enough is enough and individuals no longer want to get vaccines because they've been asked too much? Should a vaccine that has only been on the market since 2006 be pushed to mandated status? What if a few years down the road additional knowledge and research comes to light about the long-term effects and safety of the HPV vaccine? Will, program, will public health departments then lose the trust of the public? Numerous concerns exist with the public about the HPV vaccine and thus far only five geographical re regions have mandated HPV vaccine for school entry. With so many questions unanswered and sides so divided on the ramifications, both positive and negative, how can public health decide to push compulsory HPV vaccinations? With the prevalence of HPV so high, consequences of as serious as cancer and even death and high vaccine effectiveness, how does the public health realm not mandate HPV vaccinations? Yet again, the world of public health ethics lends itself to more questions than answers.